a historic night for the Conservative Party as it deals Labour a major blow in a supposedly ultra-safe seat. The Tories celebrate a stunning victory in the Copeland by-election, an area Labour represented for more than 80 years. Copeland is obviously very disappointing. Uh, I'd hoped we would have win, uh, won the election there. We didn't. Labour holds on to Stoke-on-Trent Central, seeing off a challenge from UKIP leader Paul Nuttall. We'll be live in both constituencies and getting reaction from our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. Also this lunchtime... Inexplicable, unforgivable and gut-wrenchingly sad. Gary Lineker's verdict on the sacking of Claudio Ranieri. Uh, personally, I, I think they should be building statues to him, not sacking him. Murdered by a weapon of mass destruction, authorities in Malaysia say Kim Jong-nam was killed by a banned nerve agent called VX. Royal Bank of Scotland reports a loss of £7 billion for 2016, far worse than the previous year's figure. And a group of conservation charities is launching a recruitment drive for volunteers to help protect the native red squirrel. In the south, murdered in South Africa, a Hampshire woman dies after an horrific attack by a gang of robbers. And how can one council in the south afford to cut council tax for the second year in a row? Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. It was, by any standards, a great result for the Conservatives, causing a major electoral upset by winning the long-held Labour seat of Copeland in Cumbria. Their candidate beat Labour by more than 2,000 votes. It's the first time a governing party has gained a seat at a by-election since 1982. In the night's other by-election, Labour held Stoke on Trent Central, holding off the challenge of the UKIP leader, Paul Nuttall. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says the party's win in Stoke was a decisive rejection of UKIP's politics of division, but he says their message was not enough to win through in Copeland. Our political correspondent, Carol Walker, reports. Harrison Trudy Lynn, the Conservative Party candidate, 13,748. This really was an astonishing result. Victory for the Tories in a seat which has been Labour territory since it was created. What has happened here tonight is a truly historic event. You'd have to go back more than a century to find an example of a governing party taking a seat from the opposition party in an election like this. The Conservatives are jubilant. Their new MP increased the party's share of the vote by more than 8%. The Tories have seized on the result as a resounding endorsement of Theresa May's leadership and policies and an outright rejection of Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. For them to lose a seat to the governing party, this has never happened before. Uh, and that is a show of the way in which the Labour Party is just out of, uh, out of contact with what people are thinking. The defeated Labour candidate Gillian Troughton left without saying a word. The result has piled on the anguish for Labour MPs who fear they're heading for defeat at the general election. Jeremy Corbyn has rejected suggestions he should step down. I was elected to lead this party. I was elected to lead this party to oppose austerity and oppose the, oppose the redistribution of wealth in the wrong direction, which is what this government is doing. We'll continue our campaigning work on the NHS, on social care, on housing. And there was some comfort for Labour in Stoke Central, where campaigners saw off the threat from UKIP to hold on to the seat. The party's new MP said it was a victory for the whole Labour movement. To those of you who came to Stoke-on-Trent to sow hatred and division and to turn us away from our friends and neighbours, I have one very simple message. You have failed. UKIP leader Paul Nuttall's bid for Parliament failed despite overwhelming support for Brexit locally after a campaign dogged by controversy and left him facing questions about the future of his party and his leadership. This seat was, what, number 72 on our hit list. There's a lot more which will, will, will happen, uh, a lot more to come from us. We're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. So, therefore, you know, we move on and our time will, our time will come. The result has also cast doubt on UKIP's strategy of targeting traditional Labour seats. 
This lunchtime, the Prime Minister arrived in Copeland to congratulate her party's newest MP on what she said was an astonishing victory. And what I think we've seen from this victory is that this truly is a government that is working for everyone and for every part of the country. And that's, that's, that's the message that we bring here to Copeland and that we will take across the country. But Theresa May knows that future success will depend not just on her domestic policies, but on her handling of Britain's departure from the EU. Carol Walker, BBC News. Well, in a moment, we'll get the latest from our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, who's in Stoke. But first to Ian Watson, who's in Copeland. Uh, the stuff there of Tory dreams and Labour nightmares. That just about sums it up, actually, Simon, but let me expand on that. Certainly, Theresa May's message here in the constituency in the past hour that the Conservative Party is now the party for everyone, not just the privileged few, will really rankle with uh, Labour MPs because this seat, Copeland, Back in 1983, at the height of Mrs Thatcher's powers, it stayed Labour. At the depths of Gordon Brown's unpopularity, it remained Labour. This time it's gone. Probably the word historic will be overused. But many Labour MPs see this as not simply a disappointing result, but as a catastrophic result. The question, though, is what does the party do about it? I've been speaking to voters uh, here this morning. It seems to me there are three interlinked problems which Labour now has. The first is trust. Now, nuclear is a big issue here. People want investment in new nuclear capacity. Jeremy Corbyn came here and said, actually, he believed in that after all. He was attacked for not being pro-nuclear enough. He now apparently believed in it. But not enough people believed him. The second problem, I think, is Jeremy Corbyn himself. Even left-wing Labour MPs campaigning here told me that his leadership came up unprompted on the doorstep and not in a good way. The third thing, though, is, I think, quite interesting too, Simon, and that is that some of the people here don't necessarily see Jeremy Corbyn as an anti-establishment figure. That's how he'd like to portray himself. They see Labour as the establishment party in places like this which they've uh, had the MP for the past 80 years and they don't think they've done enough for the local area. Those three problems taken together could be toxic for Labour at the next general election but the overriding problem that Labour MPs have is they tried to dislodge Jeremy Corbyn last year and they failed and it looks like they've got no workable plan B. Let's go to Norman Smith who's in Stoke where Jeremy Corbyn is going to be celebrating later on. One wonders how much celebration there'll actually be and of course Paul Nuttall, he's not celebrating either. I don't think there'll be much uh, celebrating by Mr Corbyn or uh, Mr Nuttall because let's be honest this was not just a harrowing night for Labour in Copeland, it was a difficult one for them in Stoke too even though they won because they had to struggle to hold on here in what should have been an easy peasy stroll in the park by-election for them because Stoke has been a Labour seat pretty much since the year dot but also just think where we are in the political cycle we are seven years into a Conservative government after years of austerity with what many people would say are real problems in the health service and social care and still Labour is having to fight very hard in one of its safest seats as for UKIP the question that arises following their defeat in Stoke is if they can't win here then where can they win because Stoke was a prime target for them it is big Brexit country it's a traditional working class seat where their leader Paul Nuttall thought he could hoover up votes in the event he made almost no progress and he himself took a battering the one person who seems to have emerged significantly strengthened is Theresa May who pretty much seems to be master or I should say mistress and commander of all she surveys and I have to say it does remind me of the early 1980s when then as now we seem to have a dominant female prime minister with a resurgent conservative party against a struggling opposition led by a leader many of whose own supporters have little confidence in. Norman Smith in Stoke, Ian Watson in Copeland. Thank you both very much. Well, if you want more information on the by-election results, there's more reaction and analysis on the BBC News website at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. The former Leicester and England footballer Gary Lineker has described the club's sacking of Claudio Ranieri nine months after he led them to the Premier League title as inexplicable, unforgivable and gut-wrenchingly sad. 
The Italian was dismissed last night after a string of poor results that's left the side just one point, one place above the relegation zone. Our sports correspondent Joe Wilson reports. And your manager, Claudio Ranieri! He was the smile, the face and the manager of the most extraordinary sporting success anyone in Leicester had ever seen. Well, quite possibly anyone anywhere had ever seen. And Leicester sacked him. The starkness of that reality has shocked even those who've spent their life in football. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Leicester City squad, including their coach, Claudio Ranieri. Flashback to Sports Personality of the Year, Gary Lineker, former Leicester player, lifelong Leicester fan, and to Ranieri, eternally grateful. The way that everybody got behind um, Leicester last season was just something that I'd never witnessed really in football before. And I think just to toss that all away over a premature decision um, and a disloyal and, and, and in many ways a lack of gratitude is, is, is quite gobsmacking. But I just think he deserved a little bit more loyalty and certainly more time. Uh, personally, I, I think they should be building statues to him, not sacking him. Do you think the players are culpable, Gary? Do you think there are some players who will be thinking, crikey, yeah. did I cause this yeah. today? Well, if the, if the players are involved, they should have a long, hard look at themselves as well. Um, it's, there was always going to be a kind of after the Lord Mayor's show um, season. I mean, it was never going to match um, anything like last season. This, you know, this is the reality of where Leicester normally are. You know, there are all sorts of different, different reasons why this has happened, but um, I just think it's a, it's a really s sad day f for Leicester in many ways that, that it's come to this. I think he deserved and bought himself a bit more time than this, really. Yeah. I mean, I'm not ashamed to say that last night when, when the news broke that I, I shed a tear. I shed a tear for Claudio, I shed a tear for, for football, and I shed a tear for my club. Leicester's Thai owners stressed that the club is in crisis, that they acted to help the club survive, and they urged Leicester fans to try to understand. I was very disappointed. I wasn't shocked because obviously we're not playing too well, but I was disappointed because I think after what happened last season, he definitely deserved to stay with us for the end of the season. Even if we got relegated, I think he still deserves to be our manager. Yeah. You can't run a business like this. One year does the impossible, then you're sacking the next year. They're not even down yet. Disgusting. Right. Days when players could be filmed selling fruit and veg are gone. That was the Lineker family business before football. Days when winter pitches were often mud in the past. The game's changed, the game is wealthy. But if the sacking of Ranieri is just modern football, what does that say about modern football? Joe Wilson, BBC News. Let's go to David Ornstein, who's at Leicester City's ground. And as we saw there, there is real anger out there at this. Simon, there is a feeling of high emotion in the city and among the support base today. It ranges from the sympathy for Claudio Ranieri to the downright anger at the decision to sack him. Some, however, it must be said, do understand the decision made by the club. In 2015, when Ranieri was appointed, uh, it was a de decision that raised eyebrows, really. But he proved those critics wrong. He answered them. And how? He brought celebrations to this city and this club, the like of which they'd never seen before in the club's 131, 133 year history. This stadium, ironically, the stadium where Craig Shakespeare, uh, the assistant manager, the caretaker manager, is now giving a news conference as we speak. The stadium where we saw such scenes of celebration uh, and now it's come to this. This is where Claudio Ranieri came last night to learn his fate. Now however that dream is over and all focus will turn to Liverpool on Monday. They visit the King Power Stadium and Leicester must win that. They're one point and one place above the relegation zone. They could become the first club since Manchester City in the 1930s to be relegated, having won the Premier, the, the top flight the season before. So a big task for Leicester, but they'll have to do it without Claudio Ranieri. David, thank you very much. David Ornstein there. Police in Malaysia say the half-brother of the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was murdered with a highly toxic nerve agent known as VX. Kim Jong-nam was attacked at Kuala Lumpur Airport last week. Our correspondent Stephen Evans sent this report from Seoul. Only a drop of VX was needed. The assassin pulled the cloth over Kim Jong-nam's face and his fate was certain. 
He sought urgent medical help, but so deadly is the chemical agent that nothing would have saved him. The Malaysian police chief was adamant it was VX. It is the XV or v VX, VX. VX uh, nerve agent, which is a chemical weapon. Well, you don't know how they, they were brought in? Uh, no, in we are investigating that. The police have three people in custody. The two women alleged to have actually attacked and a North Korean man said to have helped. One of the attackers may have contaminated herself. Police want to talk to at least seven others, including a North Korean diplomat and an employee of North Korea's state airline. In 2013, Kim Jong-un inspected chemical weapons masks. North Korea has long been suspected of making chemical weapons. South Korean experts think the Malaysian attack confirms that. In a tiny drop of a VX, you know, agent can kill uh, anybody within a minute. So I think uh, it is it can, uh, can observe through the skin or eye, whatever the body part. So it's uh, uh, more than 100 times toxic than the noble gas, uh, commonly used to the sarin gas. And the, the problem of this uh, VX is, is the toxic and tasteless color is, is very hard to detect. The airport in Kuala Lumpur is to be swept for traces of any other deadly chemicals that the assassination team may have left. North Korea is in effect a dynasty. The all-powerful leadership goes from father to son. Brothers are rivals. One threat to Kim Jong-un is now no more. Stephen Evans, BBC News, South Korea. Our correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes is in Kuala Lumpur for us. You've just been out to the airport where, according to authorities, a weapon of mass destruction was used a few days ago. How are they taking this? Well, a little more relaxed than they perhaps should be, Simon. I, I've been out in the airport this afternoon, this evening. Uh, it's taken a, a good hour or two to get back from there, but when we left, there were no signs at all that the authorities were carrying out the sweep or the, or the, the decontamination effort that they claimed they were going to do. So I'm afraid to say there is little credibility to their claim that they are taking the threats to other people seriously uh, and doing something about it. And uh, Rupert, in terms of what happens now, what happens to the body? What does North Korea want to happen to that? Well, I think this takes the whole crisis between Malaysia and North Korea to a completely different level, Simon. Uh, we were talking about a potential assassination until today. Now we are talking about not just an assassination, but potentially uh, the use by a country of a a banned chemical weapon in another country's major international airport. And I think this has really pushed relations between Malaysia and North Korea to the verge of breaking point today. Uh, Malaysia's foreign minister effectively threatening uh, the North Korean ambassador that if he doesn't stop uh, what he called spewing lies, uh, that then Malaysia may well expel him. Rupert Winfield Hayes, thank you very much. It's coming up to 20 past one, our top story this lunchtime. A historic night for the Conservative Party as it deals Labour a major blow in the supposedly ultra-safe seat of Copeland. Still to come, America moves to calm fears in Mexico that US troops could be sent in to deal with illegal immigrants. And coming up in South today, Wembley bound. Players and fans prepare for Southampton's League Cup final against Man United on Sunday. And fond memories of childhood as a new exhibition tells the story of Ladybird Books. Reports from the Iraqi city of Mosul say government troops have entered a neighborhood in the western half of the city. They captured the airport yesterday as part of their battle to expel Islamic State forces from its final stronghold in Iraq. We can go now to our correspondent, Weir Davis, who's with Iraqi forces near Mosul. And just how significant is this progress? Sorry, we've obviously got a problem there with the link to Wira Davis.
Sorry about that. Uh, we'll try and get where a little later on. Two other news. America's Homeland Security Chief has moved to reassure Mexico that the U.S. Army won't be deployed to deal with illegal immigrants. John Kelly made the pledge during talks in Mexico with the country's president and other senior officials. Concerns were raised after President Trump spoke about a military operation to deport criminals. Our correspondent Dan Johnson reports. There's already been a change on Mexico's border with the USA. A new flow of people heading back south. These Mexicans were sent home because America says they were living illegally. In Portland, Portland, In Portland Oregon, as I was coming out of the court when I went to pay my ticket that I owed, they were waiting for me outside. That's the new reality under what President Trump calls a military operation. You see what's happening at the border. All of a sudden, for the first time, we're getting gang members out, we're getting drug lords out, we're getting really bad dudes out of this country and at a rate that nobody's ever seen before. And they're the bad ones. Also crossing the border, Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State from Texas, here to talk to his counterpart and forced to listen to Mexican concerns. It is a fact that is obvious that Mexicans are worried, irritated before what is perceived as policies that might be harmful to our national interest and to Mexicans in Mexico and abroad. Inconsistency in tone is an early feature of the Trump administration. The Secretary of State took a much softer line than his boss. Two strong sovereign countries from time to time will have differences. We listen closely and carefully to each other as we respectfully and patiently raised our respective concerns. There were discussions with the Mexican president too. Promises of closer cooperation and reminders of the cultural bonds across the border. Figures do show the number of Mexicans leaving the US in recent years actually outstripped new arrivals. Protesters have called for bridges to be built instead of walls. I think there couldn't have been a better symbolic protest than burning Trump's wall, because there shouldn't be barriers among nations. The US president disagrees. He intends to deport more people he considers a threat and build his wall to keep them out. Dan Johnson, BBC News. We have re-established links with Wira Davis. Now he's in the Iraqi city of Mosul and uh, can update us on progress because they've entered parts of the west of the city. Indeed, look, this is a very critical point now in, in the battle for Mosul. Uh, we've heard that after taking the airport yesterday, as of dawn this morning, Iraqi forces have moved in with heavily armoured units to try and push so-called Islamic State uh, fighters back into the city itself. But it's a very built-up area, 750,000 civilians, and a very difficult city to fight in. I'm at a base now with a joint American-Iraqi military base to the south of the city. And what's apparent is that international uh, force is very much part of this. There are American artillery units here firing precision cells, shells at ISIS positions in and outside Mosul. And of course, there are American advisors also on the ground, boots on the ground, as they call them, trying to help uh, the Iraqi army to take the western part of the city. After all, this is now a very critical part of a fight to try and remove ISIS or so-called ISIS from its last big stronghold in Iraq. We're, uh, thank you very much. We're Davis there. The Royal Bank of Scotland made a loss of nearly £7 billion last year, more than three times the loss they made the year before. Our business editor, Simon Jack, is here with me now, and we've been talking about losses and RBS for an awfully long time. Yeah, if you have a sense of deja vu, this is because this is the ninth loss in a row that RBS has made. Today's £7 billion loss is on top of £51 billion over the last decade. So that's £58 billion of losses in total. Remember, the UK taxpayer put in £45 billion um, in, back in 2009. So we've gone through all of that and then some. It wasn't supposed to take this long. It was meant to be back to health now. So I spoke to the boss, Ross McEwen, this morning and said, why has it taken so long and whose fault is it? I don't think it's a matter of fault. You know, I don't think people saw the magnitude of the conduct and litigation issues that would come through. Who thought that we'd be paying as an industry 40 to 45 billion for PPI insurance? Who thought these charges would come through of this magnitude? I don't think anybody did. 
Well, we're not, it's not over yet. I think that it's very likely that RBS will make another loss next year. They've got to settle with US authorities over, uh, over RBS's role in the subprime mortgage crisis. So more to come there. But underneath it all, underneath the wreckage, there is a decent bank here pumping out a billion pounds of profit every quarter, lending to UK businesses and homeowners. But we've got some way to go before we get there. Um, thousands of jobs could also go over the next year. So pain ahead, but also some light. The bank today, for the first time, said it was pretty confident it would make a profit in 2018. Simon, thank you very much. See Simon you <laughs> Police are questioning a man and a woman over the escape of a convicted murderer in Liverpool. They are being held on suspicion of helping Sean Wormsley, who got away from guards during a hospital visit. Well, let's get the latest from our correspondent, Judith Moritz. There's still no sign of him. That's right, Sean Wormsley uh, escaped from here on Tuesday afternoon. He came for a regular hospital appointment at this hospital and as he was leaving and he was escorted here uh, for, by prison officers from Liverpool Prison a short distance away, as they were getting into a car to leave, the group were ambushed by two men whose faces were covered, brandishing a gun and a knife and who escaped with Sean Wormsley in a gold-coloured Volvo. Now, last night, Merseyside police arrested a 27-year-old man, a 26-year-old woman, both from the same address in the Norris Green area of Liverpool. They're being held, I'm told, at separate police stations today on Merseyside and being questioned about the escape on suspicion of assisting an offender. But it's not thought that they are part of the group that was there at the hospital on the day because the police say they are still looking, obviously, for Sean Wormsley and for the two men who were part of that escape. Uh, effort on Tuesday and they're telling members of the public that they should not approach Wormsley if they see him. He's a dangerous criminal. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 30 years back in 2015. Uh, Merseyside police say that they are cobing CCTV footage. They've released imagery of what happened here that afternoon in the hope that witnesses may come forward because it was in broad daylight and there were plenty of people around who may have seen what happened. The other thing I should add is that Merseyside police tell me that they are working not just with police forces around the UK on this, but also now liaising with police forces abroad. The, uh, notices of information have gone out to port authorities, to airports. They say they're working round the clock to try to get Sean Wormsley back. Judith, thank you very much. Judith Moritz. Prince Charles is reported to back new plans to sterilise grey squirrels in a bid to protect native reds. The proposals would see grey squirrels given an oral contraceptive hidden in chocolate spread, which would last several years. The Wildlife Trusts are having their biggest ever recruitment drive to help protect red squirrels. Conservation charities say the population could disappear from England, Wales and Northern Ireland within 40 years. Ashley McVeigh reports. Red squirrels were once a common sight across much of the UK, but the introduction of their grey cousins 141 years ago spelled disaster for the red population. Carrying a disease which kills reds, the bigger, greedier grey squirrel dominates our landscape more than a century on, with more than two and a half million of them around. There are just 140,000 reds in comparison. But in recent years, efforts to protect reds have had some success. And now, for the first time, the Wildlife Trusts are combining to recruit 5,000 volunteers to help with these conservation efforts. People will be asked to monitor and record data, and if they're willing, they'll be given training on how to cull grey squirrels humanely. They're hoping the Red Squirrels United project will not only maintain, but maybe even increase numbers. We can train people to help with monitoring, so using trail cameras and hair tubes. Um, we also need people to record their sightings and report them to us, and also to help with grey squirrel control. Um, and it's a really great opportunity for people to get involved in a large-scale conservation project, but also on a local level and really make a difference. This map shows how many red squirrels were around in 1945 compared to 2010. The campaign hopes to focus the efforts of volunteers on the nine areas where there are already red squirrels, including the glens of Antrim in Northern Ireland, Anglesey in Wales and Merseyside in England. The Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels Volunteer Project will also get underway.
Most of us will never get this close to a baby squirrel. Rachel's nursing this one back to health. But with this campaign, there's a chance to make sure this native species survives and maybe even flourishes once again in the UK. Ashley McVeigh, BBC News. The price of first and second class stamps will go up by one pence next month. From the end of March, a first class stamp will cost 65p, with a second class stamp increasing to 56. The Royal Mail have said the increase is needed to ensure the sustainability of the post service. A woman who died after being hit by debris in Wolverhampton city centre during yesterday's storm has been named as Tani Martin. She was 29 and from Stafford. Storm Doris caused winds of up to 100 miles an hour, causing power cuts, flights to be grounded and trains cancelled. Well, let's find out what's happening now. Uh, John Hammond has the latest weather forecast. John. Thanks, Simon. And for some of us, some welcome tranquility at last. Beautiful start to the day here in Cumbria. Mind you, in Cumbria, the sunshine will not last all that long, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, Doris has been hurtling its way out across northern parts of Europe, causing some problems there. For us, a little window of sunshine for many places through this morning. There are further fronts, though, lying in wait out in the Atlantic, and there will be rain for many of us through this weekend. So enjoy the sunshine while it lasts. As I mentioned, across so many parts of England and Wales, it will be a fine afternoon with uh, broken cloud and sunshine. There's quite a lot of cloud at the moment across some eastern counties. I'm hoping that will break up to some extent, but feeling quite cool out there after that uh, chilly start, sixes and sevens, but the winds, nothing like as strong as they have been, thankfully. Some sunshine for Cumbria. Eastern Scotland holding on to some brightness, but further west already clouding over some rain, spreading across Northern Ireland and into Western Scotland through this afternoon. This is at three o'clock, and that rain will continue to head eastwards overnight. A period of snow, actually, up over the highlands before it turns back to rain again. Uh, rain will cascade its way down across many areas, though very little reaching southern counties. The main oomph will be further north. The winds continue to increase as well, but temperatures will be on the rise here. Uh, further south, for a time at least, under clear skies, it will be quite a chilly night. Now, tomorrow morning doesn't look uh, all that clever at all. A lot of wind and rain around, particularly across the more northern and western areas. It will improve across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Things will brighten up through the afternoon. The winds will die down too. Some showers across the far northwest. Dribs and jabs uh, further southeast across England and Wales. A mild day technically, but of course with the wind and the rain it won't feel all that pleasant. And the rain will be most in evidence, I think, through this weekend across parts of Cumbria. Yes, just look at it racing across from the west. Some respite for a time on Sunday before the rain returns again later on in the day. That's of some concern. We're keeping our eye on rainfall totals for Cumbria through this weekend. The risk of some flooding. Now, there are warnings in force because we've got another weather system coming in during the course of Sunday, especially again to the more northern western areas with increasing winds. Further south and east on Sunday, again, most of the dry and bright weather. There will be some sunshine around, some increasing cloud, but a largely fine end to the weekend here. And again, temperatures doing pretty well up and down the UK, up into double figures in many places. But that will be tempered by the wind and the rain across the north and the west. So to sum up this weekend, it will be mild. It'll be blustery at times, but nothing like as windy as it has been. It has to be stressed. And there'll be some rain around too, particularly across those more northern and western areas. All the latest on the warnings, as ever, can be found on our BBC weather website. Simon. John, thank you very much. A reminder of our main story this lunchtime. A historic night for the Conservative Party as it deals Labour a major blow in the supposedly ultra-safe seat of Copeland. Copeland is obviously very disappointing. Uh, I'd hoped we'd have win, uh, won the election there. We didn't. That's all from the BBC News at one, so it's goodbye from us. And on BBC One, we can now join the BBC's news teams where you are. From me, good afternoon. <laughs>